is done in our life. morning. I know uh, we don't do announcements in this service, but today I have some information for you which you might find important. Uh, we're coming up to that time of the year again where we're going to have an annual general meeting, and this will be held on Wednesday night, the 25th of November, starting at 6.30, and that'll be in this place where we are right now. Um, there's a few items of business we're going to attend attend to you, not just the run-of-the-mill stuff. There will actually be uh, a vote on the guiding principles. You remember we were engaged in discussions on this last year and since then the, the input from you people have been listened to. We've got a revised guiding principles now for you to look at and vote on to see whether you feel that's suitable to be our new bylaws or replace the existing bylaws. That'll be one item of business to attend to. And the other is, there's going to be um, a motion to appoint a senior pastor to this church presented at that meeting. I don't have any more information on that for you at the moment, but as you can see, there's a lot of very important items to be discussed at this meeting, and it'd be great if everybody could be there on that night. Uh, remember, only members, active members of the church can vote, but anybody can attend. Now, the other thing is that today nominations are open for the appointment of elders to this church. We've already got 
three, um, Pam Weston, Bruce Green and myself. Uh, Pam and Bruce, they're, all, they're halfway through our term, so they're good for another 12 months to go, but my term is up and it's possible I could be voted back in again. Or you might have other people in mind that you would like to nominate as well. And just some information, when it comes to nominating people, it's not just a matter of going through the church directory and saying, oh yes, that, that person's pretty good, I think I'll vote for them. It's a little more complicated. We'd like you to put a little more effort into it than that. You've got two weeks from today to submit a nomination to the board for the position of elders. And um, I'll try not to take too long with this, but when you're nominating a person to be an elder, you should keep in mind what's written down in the first book of Timothy, chapter 3, the first seven verses. And uh, this is the qualifications we use in this place to appoint elders, starting at verse 3. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may be conceited, may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So you can read 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7 again for yourselves when you're thinking about this. I have nomination forms here if you wish to take one to nominate and I won't be around at the end but Evan might be happy to provide you with one of these if you're looking for one. And the other business of the annual general meeting will be the receipt of annual reports and approval of our annual budget. Um, Project Christmas Child is down here with these shoe boxes. If you would like to do that, you've got a couple of weeks. They should be in by the end of this month where you can fill them with suitable gifts for children overseas. And also, just reminding you about the health regulations we're under at the moment. You all look like you're sitting pretty well at the moment. But remember to keep the distance for non-family groups. I think that's about it. Perhaps you'd like to join with me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time that we can come and share together and come and worship you. I pray that today you will speak to each one of us and more importantly, I pray that each one will listen as you speak. Help us to go from here encouraged as we come through the week that is before us. Be prepared to encourage one another and others we come across through the week, to know that you love us and care for us, even though we cannot possibly do anything to deserve it, you do this constantly. I also pray that it is within your power to release this world from the trouble we find ourselves in the moment with the COVID virus. I know it's within your power to remove it from the world, but we look at past history and that's probably not what you have in mind for us. But nevertheless, we can pray that you deliver us from this, this virus, that we are all very careful, that we care for each other and that we love each other. Be with us now as we sing and pray and listen and go from here with your word in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just stand again as we continue our praise of our beautiful Lord and Saviour.
At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let's continue our worship before we have our communion.
everyone. Welcome to the Lord's Table this morning. Today I just want to talk about something that we might uh, put communion in the context of the world that we're living in at the moment. I want to talk about can cancel culture. That's hard to say. Cancel culture. If, you've known, if you know anything about cancel culture, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. From Wikipedia, it says, cancel culture describes a form of boycott in which someone who has performed an act that is considered a violation of today's social justice norms, even if those acts occurred very long ago, is thrust out of social or professional circles, either online or social media, or in the real world, or even both, they are said to be cancelled. Cancel culture came into effect around 2015, became extremely popular in 2018. Now, some of you don't buy a new dictionary every year so that you can know what all the latest words are, but cancel culture became the number one word in the Macquarie Dictionary for 2019. That's how important it is. Now, you may not have heard of it, but you will have heard of what happens with it. So here's another definition, just uh, this one from Cambridge. It's a way of behaving in a society or group, especially on social media, in which it is common to completely reject and, to, uh, and stop supporting someone because they have said or done something that offends you. The main, uh, somebody been on fa Facebook recently, you know what I'm talking about. The main argument against cancel culture is that it doesn't, not like our Heavenly Father, enable people who have wronged society the opportunity to apologize and learn from their mistakes. Let's call cancel culture for what it is then. It is our way of trying to expect, exert some control over a world which is increasingly becoming more dangerous and less tolerant. In cancel culture, we point ourselves, we appoint ourselves as the arbiters of right and wrong and also judge and jury because thanks to social media we get to dole out the punishment. Now I'm very sympathetic to a lot of issues and a lot of groups who are trying to right things at the moment and who are exposing wrong. However, many lives, many businesses, many organisations have been cancelled Reputations destroyed, and some e e e innocent people have even lost their lives. So where does this all fit in? Goodness me. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a path before each person that seems right, but the end of it is death. If we choose our own way, and if we choose what's right and wrong, without referring to God, the end of that is death. As Christians, we don't really belong in part of that culture. And today, we are here around the table to remember Jesus. He had many enemies when he was here on earth, but he didn't fight Rome. He won by dying on the cross and rising again, triumphant. We have two sacraments in Churches of Christ normally that we recognise, and that's baptism and the Lord's Supper, and there are similarities in both of these things. Well, incidentally, Grant's birthday tomorrow, and it's his first birthday today of, well, Sunday-wise, of being baptised. Good to see you, Grant. We remember God's cancel culture. You haven't heard of that at all, have you? It's the total opposite of the world's cancel culture. And we find this in Colossians 2, 12 to 20. 
For you were buried with Christ when you were baptised, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. That's where we put our trust. You were dead, or you were cancelled in other words, because of your sins and because of your sinful nature, were not yet cut away. Then God made you alive in Christ and he forgave all our sins. He cancelled, not you or me, he cancelled the record of the charges against us forever and took it away, nailing it to the cross. That's how God cancels the evil in the world. So don't let anyone condemn you, the Bible says. And so don't condemn anyone else either, by the way. For you who eat or drink, or for, for, for what you eat or drink, or for not celebrating certain holidays, or moons, or Sabbaths, for these things are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. You have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world so the death of Christ has brought us forgiveness when our sins were nailed on the cross and totally cancelled that's totally different from somebody accusing us and cancelling us our forgiveness is from the death of Jesus. He did this. The Romans, the temple staff, and the demonic powers were cancelled when Jesus died and when he rose again. So, some of you older ones will, will remember a hymn that says, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And one other line says, He breaks the power of cancel sin. He sets the prisoner free. And that's what we remember this morning. We remember the death of Jesus on the cross and the fact that no matter how many people want to cancel us, God has cancelled our sins on the cross. So let's just, uh, we're going to have communion this morning. It will be brought around. The bread will be in a little cup. Just hold that cup until the the, the, the second cup comes along hold that also, don't pass it along and then it will be collected at the end let's just pray Father we live in a confused and troubled world we see everybody well not everybody but so many people angry about this, that and the other Father help us not to get angry about things and fight the same way that the world would and trying to cancel people and things and governments. But Father, help us to realise and to give thanks this morning as we partake this bread and this cup that you have cancelled our sin and you have accepted us as your people. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. and when the second cup comes along we'll just hold that for a moment until we take it all together.
morning we're here to give thanks to our Lord Jesus. We're not here to judge or to cancel anyone, but we're here to give thanks that the blood of Jesus can set us all free from sin. And we remember that as we take this cup. morning taken up but uh, you can give to the Lord's work by giving online or several different ways but there's also a box over there at bottom and for our ministry our ministry is not to judge not to cancel but to be people who minister the reconciliation between man and God and man and man we're here to show the love of Jesus we pray that our uh, uh, gifts and offerings will be used in that. I hope that's helped you to understand something about how communion can mean something in today's culture. God bless. Good morning. How are we this morning? It's a lovely day outside, great day to come together into God's house. We'll say welcome for those who are watching online. It's great having you with us as well today, joining in with our service. Today we're going to finish off this series that we've been going through for the last um, few weeks called The Words We Say. We started off this series by, by looking at, we need to be quick to what? Quick to Listen there and slow to. Yes, well done. Um, but we learned that we also don't always and don't often do this. We learned that we don't always have a rein on our tongue. Sometimes our tongue has a mind of its own and it spits out words that we wish after we said them we could quickly grab them and, and stuff them back in, but we can't and it's too late. And so we talked about having, having some filters, having some questions that we ask ourselves before we speak. Those questions were, is it true? Is it kind? Is it helpful? If we think about those questions but before we speak, we hopefully can, can stop some of that unwholesome talk that we talked about last week coming out of our mouths. Last week, we also learned that our conversations with each other should be conversations that build each other up. That after you've finished a conversation with someone, they should be able to leave that conversation in a better place than where they started. To do this, though, we talked about how we're going to get rid, need to get rid of that bitterness in our hearts because it's from our hearts is what comes from, from our mouths, the words that we speak. If we've got bitterness in our hearts, the words we use and say won't be useful for building others up. So we need to get rid of them. And we talked about doing that but by forgiveness. Forgiveness is the antidote to, for, for bitterness. But it isn't easy to do, to forgive people. Because for most of us, when we've been hurt, when we've been wronged, our first reaction, our first reaction is to get even, is to get back at them, to give them what they deserve to take revenge. And sometimes, probably more than what you think, sometimes what goes around comes around. Sometimes we have the people who have wronged us People who have slandered us and maybe said things against us that weren't true, sometimes they are in front of us. And the words that we say not, will not only determine their future, but also our own. And it's in those times that we need to be careful with the words that we say. Maybe this morning you might be here sitting here with revenge on your mind. Maybe something has happened this week or maybe something happened a long time ago and it's still there. 
And you've got, oh man, the next time I see them, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. If that is you, I'm glad that you're here. I really am. Because today, we're actually going to be looking at how do we deal with those feelings of taking revenge? How do we deal with that in our life? If you remember last week, I finished off last week by saying today we're going to be looking at one of the greatest stories ever told in the Old Testament. And today we're going to be looking at the story of Joseph. Some of you might know this story because maybe you've heard it once at Sunday school or maybe you know it because you read your Bible and you've read it a number of times. Or maybe for you this might be your first time you've ever heard this story. No matter what situation you're in, I, I, I really hope and I've been praying this week that you'll listen to the story of Joseph and put yourself there. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes and, and, and just soak up what Joseph did during his times of trouble. So let's start the story of Joseph. So Joseph is one of ten sons of Jacob. But there's something a little bit different about Joseph. And that was that he was loved more than his other brothers. He was the most loved child. Now, in other words, he was the favourite son. Now, I know there's parents here. I know there's kids here. And I remember thinking that my brother, oh no, my sister was, was the favourite child. And you might be sitting here going, yeah, well, the favourite child was them. It wasn't me. And for parents, I know you, you're sitting here going, favourite children? No, there's no such thing. We, we don't have favourites. We, we love them all the same. But this wasn't the case for Jacob. He had a favourite son. And the reason why, it wasn't because when Joseph asked him to turn off his Xbox, he, he turned it off straight away and come to the table and did what he's told. Because sometimes that's just the dream, that kids will do that. But, but why Joseph was the favourite was because... Jacob had a favourite wife, and Joseph was the son of his favourite wife. Now, I'm not going to get into that story, but I will encourage you to, to read that because it is a great story, and it sort of leads up to where um, we're talking about Joseph. So I encourage you to, to go back um, through Genesis uh, 37, before 37, and read um, that story about how, uh, jo um, how Jacob had a favourite wife. But the one thing we need to know is Joseph was the favourite. And his brothers knew it. His brothers knew that he was... He may have got the, the biggest serving of, of meal. He might have got the, the, the best food all the time. might have got the biggest helping. And to make matters, just to make sure everyone knew that Joseph was the favourite, his father decided to, to make him a hand-sewn robe, a special robe that he gave him. Not to anyone else, just to Joseph. So this was just to make sure that everyone knew that Joseph was the favourite and, and Joseph would wear that wherever he went. Now what you think about the brothers for a moment? How do you think those brothers were feeling? Do you think they're feeling, oh, you know, it's, that's really great for Joseph. I'm really glad he's, he's the favourite. He's got that, that special robe from Dad. No, they were pretty angry. They were, had a lot of animosity towards him. But don't worry, things get worse. One day, Joseph has a dream. He has a series of dreams, and they're really vivid dreams, dreams that meant something. And he's sort of, he sort of asking God, and he got the, the, the meaning for these dreams, and he thought, you know what, I'm going to tell my brothers and dad about these dreams. So he goes to his brothers and his dad, and he tells them about these dreams, and these dreams meant that his, his dad and all his brothers will bow down to him, that like, this whole kingdom was going to bow down to him. And like his brothers, you know, if they weren't fuming before, they, they were definitely fuming now. Even his father rebuked him for this, saying, hey, Joseph, I think you've gone a little bit too far this time. You know, I know you're the favourite, but maybe, you know, you've just gone a little bit too far this time. So we can see that this household had a lot of, like, a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness, especially between Joseph and his brothers. One day, the brothers were out grazing the sheep and Joseph was at home. I think that sort of tells us that he definitely was the favourite, you know. He should have been out there with his brothers, but he wasn't. He was getting looked after at home. So the brothers were out. It wasn't just like in a paddock next door to the house sort of thing. It was, it was far away. They'd take their sheep a long way to, to, to graze them. It wasn't just, you know, just around their, their house. 
And so Joseph had to, the job of going out and supplying his brothers with some food. And from a long way off, his brothers saw Joseph. They couldn't miss him, right? He had the robe, you know. And they would have been, they would have been thinking, oh, here's that favourite son again. Here he comes. I wonder what, he's gonna, what dreams he's going to have this time. Anyway, so he's walking up and the brothers are getting together. They're thinking, oh, I'm sick of this. Let's kill him. Let's, let's get away. You know, let's, let's do away with him. Let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. And they're starting to go, yeah, yeah, let's do this. Then they thought about, you know, we're going to have blood on our hands. If dad finds out, you know, we're, we're in big trouble. And so one of the brothers then sort of talks him around. says, hey, hey let's not, you know, have, kill anyone. But, you know, there's you know, an, an empty well here. He's got no water. Let's just put him in there and we'll, we'll sort something out. So that's what they did. Joseph came up, they ripped his, his robe from him, that special robe, and they, they chucked him in the well. Then they had lunch. They had lunch. Joseph was bringing the surprise. So they sat down and they were eating together. They may be discussing, you know, what are we going to do with Joseph? We haven't killed him, but the problem is if we let him out, he's going to run home to dad. You know, we're going to be in big trouble when he gets home. Um, so they were thinking, what are we going to do? So they're eating lunch, discussing. Then in the distance, they see these slave traders coming. The, the slave traders used to come and, and get some, some people, gather up some people, so then take back to Egypt to sell. So they have the idea of, you know, we won't get blood on our hands, we won't kill anyone, but we'll send him off and we'll never have to deal with him again. So they, they all agree to this and they pull Joseph out and they tie him up and they sell him to these slave traders. Joseph is taken to Egypt and is sold to the captain of the guard, Potiphar, and he went to work in his house. Joseph worked hard and, and gained favour with Potiphar, and before long he was in charge of the whole household. He was looking after things, managing um, the, the servants, and he was in charge. Now Joseph was also a good-looking fella, and Potiphar's wife knew it and didn't miss it. And so she tried to seduce him, tried to get him to sleep with her. But time after time, Joseph refused her advances. And he refused her advances not only because Potiphar had, had you know, made him in charge of the house, a slave boy that had come in, made him in charge of the house, withheld nothing except for his wife from him, he had great respect for Potiphar, but it wasn't just that. And here's the hint. He didn't want to do it because he didn't want to sin against God. And see, Joseph still had his faith in God, even how he was put into slavery. And, and that's a bit of a clue there when we read that. Potiphar's wife didn't give up. And one day, the, the, all the servants were out of the room. It was only just her and Joseph. And, and she tries to grab him and says, you know, come with me. He manages to escape and sort of gets out of his cloak and she's left holding his cloak while he runs and flees. She wasn't too happy about this. So, you know, someone dismissed her, her, advan her advances. So she makes up an elaborate story that Joseph tried to sleep with her. And that she screamed out and all that was left was this cloak. You can imagine once Potiphar heard about this, he was quite angry, quite enraged. Because he had trusted Joseph to be in charge of his household and he felt that Joseph had betrayed him. Potiphar throws Joseph in the king's jail where the king's prisoners are kept. And then we read, while Joseph was in prison, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. You might be thinking, how is that even possible? The Lord was with him. If the Lord was with him, he wouldn't be in prison, you might think. If the Lord was with him, it would be his brothers. It would be Potiphar's wife. It wasn't fair. He had done nothing wrong. Maybe for some of you this morning, you're feeling a bit like Joseph. You're in your own type of prison. Maybe it's your health. You haven't got the health like you wanted and it feels like you're trapped in a prison. Maybe it's your finances. You can't seem to, to, to get out of this hole that you find yourself in. 
and you're trapped in some sort of prison. Maybe it's your family, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe that's where your bitterness is coming from, that those things that you feel like you're just trapped in a prison where you don't belong and it's unfair. It certainly doesn't feel like God is with you. But he was with Joseph and he is with you. Joseph, like he did in Potiphar's house, also gains favour, works hard and ends up becoming the administrator of the jail. You know, Joseph has this way of rising to the top. Comes the administrator of the jail, still a prisoner, still wears the prison clothes, but he sort of has some oversight of the prison. One day the king's baker and the wine taster, they fall out of favour with the king and they are thrown into jail. Because Joseph is administrating the jail, he gets to know them, he gets to chat with them and, and talk with them. One day the, the, the cupbearer and the baker had strange dreams, vivid dreams that meant something. And Joseph comes around to see them like, like he normally would and, and he sees them and he sees that they're upset and he goes, oh, what's going on, guys? And they say, oh, we've had these strange dreams, dreams that mean something. I wish we knew what they meant. Joseph remembers the time that he had those strange dreams and he did know what they meant. He told them this and said, you know, if, if you're willing to share it with me, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go at trying to interpret those dreams for you. So the cupbearer tells Joseph about his dream and Joseph says, well, in three days' time, you're going to be free from prison and you'll be reinstated as the chief cupbearer. Then Joseph says this, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews and even here I have done nothing to deserve to be put in a dungeon. When this comes true, don't forget me. Joseph wanted out of that jail. He had had enough time in there. He wanted out. When the baker heard the good news that the cupbearer got, he's sort of like pushing the cupbearer out of the road. I can't wait to hear my good news. You know, can't wait. So he goes on and tells Joseph his dream. Joseph goes on to explain that his dream meant that he will be free, free of his life. He was going to be beheaded in three days' time. Three days later, just as Joseph said, the wine taster got reinstated in his position and the baker, well, he lost his head. Joseph would have thought, this is it. Start packing the bags, the wine taster. He's going to remember me. I, I told him about the dream. It all come true. Start saying goodbye to the prisoners. And a few days pass and nothing's happened. He's still there. Maybe he's thinking, oh, you know, he's trying to work up to it. You know, it takes a bit of time to talk to the Pharaoh. And a few weeks pass. Oh, you know, maybe he's still, maybe still working up to it. He'll, he'll do it. I, he told me, you know, I, I said, you know, remember me. Then a few months pass. Must have been starting to think by now, I, I think he's forgotten. Then a year passes. He had been forgotten about. Joseph was still in jail. Maybe that's where you are. Feel like you're forgotten about. That this injustice has happened. You've been stuck in this prison, whatever it is for you, through no fault of your own. Doesn't feel like God is with you. Feels like you're all alone, all forgotten. Two whole years pass when Pharaoh has a series of dreams. These dreams were really vivid again. You know, he, met, he knew that these must mean something. He calls for all the magicians and the wise men in, in all of Egypt to come and try to interpret these dreams. But they couldn't. Maybe Pharaoh was stressing out because the cupbearer, maybe he's drinking a lot because the cupbearer got to hear about the, the stresses that Pharaoh had. And the cupbearer has that light bulb moment. Oh, I remember. There was that guy named Joseph who was in prison. 
And he goes to Pharaoh, oh, remember that time you threw some servants in prison? We won't, remem we won't remember why they were there. We'll forget about that. Anyway, when I was there, I met this guy named Joseph and I had a strange dream. I didn't know what it meant. I told him, you know, he told me what it meant and then it all came true, every single word. By this time, Pharaoh must have been desperate because he was desperate enough to pull someone out of jail to try to interpret his dreams. And so he calls for Joseph to come before him, not before he has a shower and a clean change of clothes, but he comes up to um, Pharaoh and Pharaoh tells him about this dream that he had. And Joseph, like he did to the cupbearer and the baker, tells the Pharaoh what this dream meant. That there'll be seven good years and seven bad years where no rain will fall. The seven bad years will be so bad that those good years, you won't even remember them. They're going to be like some distant memory of long time ago. And he goes, unless you store up some grain during those good years, unless you take the time to do something when the going is good, everyone will die. You will die. The whole nation will just be a wreck. But if you manage this well, if you manage the good years well, Joseph says, Pharaoh, you're going to become the richest and the wealthiest man in whole of Egypt. You're going to own more stuff than you can ever dream about. Pharaoh likes this idea. He's going, yes, give me some of that. He goes, I like what this guy has to say. He seems to know his stuff. He seems to, to understand what is, is required during these good years. So Joseph is made in charge of everything. He's made like the prime minister. The only person who would have more power than Joseph would be Pharaoh himself. How did Joseph get in this position? He'd been in training. Been in training in Potiphar's house, managing those slaves, managing the household. Actually been in training in prison. Been the administrator in the prison. And if you think about it, he would not have even been in training unless he'd came to Egypt. And the only way that the favourite son was ever going to make it to Egypt is if his brothers sold him as a slave. You know, sometimes those hard things that we're going through, sometimes those things that we're feeling like that, that we don't deserve, they can actually be training for what God has for us next. So during those seven good years, Joseph manages the grain, he taxes um, the people and, and they store up the grain. Actually, you have to build more storage facilities because there just isn't enough room for all this grain. Then the seven bad years came, not one drop of rain. People were suffering. They were needing food. So they come to Joseph, Pharaoh, to, 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 to buy some things. They were selling their land. They were selling their possessions. Pharaoh become very, very wealthy. But remember Joseph's family, his brothers, his dad? They too were suffering under this same famine, this same drought. They too were suffering. So Joseph's dad lines up the boys and says, Hey, we can sit around here and mope and, and die, or you boys, you know, I've heard about this, this pharaoh, this, this prime minister in Egypt, he's been storing this grain. Maybe, you know, you guys need to go and get some grain so we can survive. So he packs off the brothers and sends them to Egypt. They, they hop in the line, which I imagine would have been a long line waiting for, for the food. And so that they're lining up and they see this prime minister coming towards him and, you know, out of respect, they bow down to him. Joseph recognises them, but they don't recognise Joseph. Maybe it's because he's now 30 years old, he's changed a lot. Maybe they thought when they sold him off into slavery, he would never become prime minister. Well, we've got to ask ourselves this question. What do we do when we have our enemy before us? What do we do when we have those ones who have wronged us and they're there before us. We are now in a position of power. We can now do the what comes around, goes around to them. What do you do when you have the power to determine their destiny? The power to give them what they deserve, to take revenge. What do you do and say in that moment? 
I'm sure when Joseph saw his brothers, he thought about being sold into slavery. Thought about that time in Potiphar's house when he's accused of doing the wrong thing. Pretty sure he thought about being in jail all alone. Probably thought about maybe why I should get revenge. But the story continues on for a few months with lots of detail that I won't go into today because of time. But it concludes with this scene. The, the, the brothers are back in Egypt lining up to get their food. Joseph sees her there again and he orders the guards to go and collect them and, and bring them to his room where he is. Imagine the brothers are going, why is this prime minister wanting to see us? You know, we're worried now for our lives, you know, we've done something wrong. So they come and they gather before him. Joseph dismissed the guards, say, you guys, just leave it here for now. Leave me alone with these guys. And then Joseph tells them who he is. I'm your brother, Joseph, the one who you sold into slavery. You can imagine what went on in their minds. Uh-oh. wonder what's going to happen here. I thought I was afraid of the prime minister, but I'm more afraid of my brother who I sold into slavery. What's he going to do to me? But, but they did not need to be afraid because Joseph had been living as if God was with him, even when it didn't feel like it. And it's because of that he kept bitterness at bay. It's because of that he kept working hard and kept doing what God had for him to do. Because he believed that God had a plan that God was with him and he had a plan that even through all this hard time, that God was going to, to reveal his plan to him. He had a choice though. He could have sat in Potiphar's household. He could have sat in the jail and said, woe to me. You know, life has just dealt me this awful set of cards. I'm just going to sit here and just waste away. That's not what he did. He lived as God was with him. He actually worked hard. He gained respect. He got into positions where God had been training him for what God needed him for. But we often think that, you know, during these times when we're faced with our enemy, when we're faced with them, that, you know, we just need the right words to say at the right time. But I don't think that's true. See, I think it's what happens in the the before time, in the in-between time of when someone's hurt you and when you see them face to face, that matters. See, in that between time, we've got a choice about who, how are we going to live? Are we going to live as God is with us, as God has got a plan for our life? So when what goes around comes around, when you're face to face with your enemy, where your words can bring them down, give them what they deserve, or with your words, you can build them up and offer forgiveness. What is it that we are going to do? It's all going to come down as to what you did in the in-between time. Did you dwell on it? Did you go, oh, this is my hard lot in life. I don't deserve this. Or did you go, you know, I'm going to keep living as God is with me, even how I don't feel like it. I'm going to keep living as God is with me and that God has a plan even though I can't see it. So I'll tell you this. God had a plan and he was with Joseph the whole time and he has a plan and he is with us the whole entire time. As we close today, I don't know what you're going through. You might be going through a whole lot of stuff right now. But I want you to remember that God is with you. He has a plan for you. And you need to live as that is the case. You need to start living that out. Keep working hard. Keep learning what God has for you to learn in the between time. Because God just might be preparing you for something, something great. And this stuff that you're going through right now, it's going to seem like just such a little blimp in the whole you know, existence of your life to what God wants to do for your future. Get rid of that bitterness. But do that, yes, by forgiving, 
but also in that in-between time, live as God is with you, as God has a plan for your life. Because he is with you and he does have a plan for your life. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. As people who are broken, as people who have said things that we shouldn't have said, as people that sometimes want to seek revenge rather than seeking you. Father, I don't know who, who here this morning is, is, is suffering with wanting to take revenge right now. But Lord, I know that you want them to see you. That you want them to see that you are still with them even during this prison time they're in. That they're not alone. That you are with them. They're not forgotten. You remember them. That Lord, you have a plan for them. Father, these words that you give us are such an encouragement for our lives. If we take hold of them and apply them to our life. So, Father, my prayer for us all today is not to leave and forget, but remember that you are always with us, that you have a plan for us even when it doesn't feel like it. Lord, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing our last song and just know that whatever you're feeling or whatever you've done in your past, you can lay it at the altar and start living your life the way he's planned for us. Let's sing. Sing.
us today I hope you've been encouraged by that I hope you take up that challenge that even when it doesn't feel like it even when you're in your prison that you still live as God is with you because he is let me just close in prayer father God we're so grateful we're able to come before you this morning lift our praise to you Lord List our hearts and our prayers and our petitions to you. Take time to remember what you did for us through communion. And also then to hear from your word. Father, you've challenged us once again to go out and live your message. Lord, as we go from here, my prayer is that we take that challenge up. We live as you are with us because you are. Father, I pray that the blessings that you give to us, that we'll be able to pour them out on the people that we come in contact with, that the words we say will not bring others down, but build them up, that we can point them to you. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Mel, to come here in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.